Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we come before you and we ask as we open your word, Father, that it would speak to us. Father, we pray that you would use it to convict us, to transform us, to impact us. Lord, to reveal yourself to us. Lord, may you have your way with us in the moments that lie ahead. We ask this and we pray this now in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. How many of you have ever made a trade? Ever traded for something? Anybody raise your hand if you're a trader. Like, a, you know, not that kind of trader. A trader. Somebody who's ever traded something. We've all traded something uh, in our lives, haven't we? If you grew up poor, like I did, you probably got real good at trading for things as a kid. When I was growing up, I traded my brothers for stuff all the time. I uh, traded my cousins for stuff all the time. Traded friends for stuff all the time. I've traded for pocket knives and BB guns. I've traded for G.I. Joes and Transformers. Other cool little toys that a little boy would be interested in. In grade school, my mom used to send me to uh, school with a lunch. It was back before everybody got lunch for free, you know, like today. But um, we, had, we took our lunch to school. Any of y'all took your lunch to school? Old people. I knew we had a church full of old people. <laughs> took your lunch to school, didn't you? And your mama, she loved you enough to pack your lunch and put it all together for you. And then you would go and you would sit down with your friends, or even your enemies for that matter, and you would trade, wouldn't you? You would, you would trade. I mean, I remember going to, to school and sitting there and... I knew whose mamas packed good desserts. I, I knew who, who was going to have something good in their lunchbox. And I would sit by them. And if you got lucky, you could trade your sloppy, soggy salami sandwich for, you know, an ice cold cup of pudding. Hmm, that's a good trade. If you could pull something like that off. But, um, you know, we continue to trade as we get older. The only difference in our trade now is our trades get more expensive, have bigger consequences to them. The stakes are higher, if you will, but we continue to be people who make trades. I would say, in reality, we're professional traders because everything you do in life is a trade. You trade your time for a paycheck. You traded your first house for your second one, and your second one for your third one. You go down to the the new car dealership or the used car dealership, and you trade one vehicle for the next. You'll trade a shift with a buddy at work so you can attend a wedding for a friend or a family member, or so you can uh, attend one of your kids' games, or just so you can have an extra day off. For your vacation, but you'll make that trade. You might trade something out of your garden for something out of your neighbor's garden or something out of your neighbor's freezer or something out of your neighbor's barn for that matter, but you'll make that trade. Everything we do in life is essentially a trade. Even the things we purchase are trades. You trade that stuff called money For bags of groceries, you trade that stuff called money for gas at the gas pump. You trade that stuff called money to take your family out to eat. That's a trade. You're trading something you have for something somebody else has. If you think about it, so much of life is trading. Life is a series of trades. And when you trade with somebody, there's three basic things that can happen. There's three ways a trade can go. And, you know, professional traders like y'all would know this. Not telling you nothing new here, at least. And it doesn't matter if you're trading on the playground in kindergarten or at the lunch table in grade school or if you're trading for something big as an adult. There's three ways any trade can go. The first way is what we might call a bad trade. Trades can go bad, can't they? 
The bad trade is when you get the short end of the deal. (laughs) When you traded your pudding for that soggy salami sandwich, you made a bad trade. Especially if it had mustard on it. It'd be even worse. Nasty. Mustard people. Or, or when you go down and you trade your vehicle, and you didn't just trade, but you traded when you were upside down. And so you rolled all that money you still owed on that other one onto your new one. And you woke up somewhere down the road and you thought to yourself, I don't know if that was a good trade. Listen, don't, don't, don't get on to yourself if you made a bad trade. We've all made bad trades, haven't we? How many of y'all made a bad trade at some point in your life? Yeah, bad trades happen. It's possible for one person to be a part of a bad trade and another person to get the good side of that trade. It's also possible for everybody in the trade to end up with a bad trade. Bad trades happen. It's just part of being a trader. There's also what you might call a neutral trade, a fair trade. This is a trade where everybody gets a little bit of something they want, usually in a fair trade. Everybody gives up a little bit of something too. Fair trade is where everybody walks away kind of on equal footing. You got something you wanted, I got something I wanted, and we were both happy about it when the trade was over. And those happen a lot in life too, and those are, those are good trades. And then there's what you might call a great trade. A great trade can come about in a lot of different ways, and hopefully you come about them in the honest way, but a lot of times when people make a great trade, they do it in a dishonest way. You know, a great trade, and I'll use an example here that I'm sure none of y'all would do, you good church-going type here. But a a great trade would be something like, you know, you find that unsuspecting widow, and her husband has a 67 Corvette tucked away in his garage in mint condition. He babied it his whole life. And she has no idea what it's worth. And you heard from a friend of a friend of a friend whose cousin told his buddy about his nephew's grandma who has this thing tucked away in her garage and you just decided to pull over at her house and knock on her door and see if you could take a little look. And she agrees because she's sweet. She's a sweet grandma. And you go in there and you pull that tarp off that Corvette. And sure enough, there it is in all its glory. But you look at it with a real straight face. And you go, you know, ma'am, oh boy, I tell you what. Thing is really dirty. Mm. It's been sitting a long time. I'm going to have to go through the whole motors. No telling what that's going to cost. You know what, I'll take it off your hands for... 1500 bucks. You probably need to get it out of your garage. Just think just in your way. I'll do you a favor. I'll bring you the cash this afternoon. That'd be a great trade if you could pull that off, right? At least for you it would, not for her. You know, I, I think about the, one of the greatest trades I ever made in my life. She's sitting right here, Abby. Don't spit your coffee out. LAUGHTER yeah, it worked out real good for me. Maybe not so good for her. It's a good thing love is blind. Amen, guys? Amen. It's a good trade for me. Not so good for her. But see, a great trade, typically a great trade has somebody on the other side that didn't get as good of a deal. And that's what makes it great for you. I bet everybody in this room has made all three kinds of trades. You've made bad trades, you've made neutral or fair trades, and you've made a couple of really great trades at some point in your life. Again, hopefully in an honest way, not a dishonest way, but you've walked away going, man, that was a great trade. In our text today, in Mark chapter 1, there's a lot we could say about this text, but I want to focus on a trade that happens here. And I want to see if you can spot the trade. I bet a group of professional, lifelong traders like y'all will be able to spot it for sure, real easy. But even if you don't see it when we read through it the first time, don't worry, because I'll point it out at the end. Here's what it says, Mark 1, 39 through 45. He went into all of Galilee, this is Jesus, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons, 
Then a man with leprosy came to him on his knees and begged him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And then verse 41 says, Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. And there's a period there. He reached out his hand and touched him. And then he said, I am willing, be made clean. And immediately the text says the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And then Jesus sternly warned him and sent him away at once, telling him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet, verse 45, he went out and he began to proclaim it widely to spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he was out in deserted places and they came to him from everywhere. The big idea for our text today is simple but powerful. It simply says this, if you want to fill it in the blanks in your bulletin. If Jesus offers you a trade, take it. If Jesus ever offers you a trade, take it. A hundred percent of the time, when Jesus comes and wants to trade with you, take it. If I come and want to trade with you, better think about it, okay? I'll be honest with y'all. If your neighbor comes over and wants to trade with you, you might want to consider the trade and think about it. But if Jesus comes and wants to trade with you, a hundred percent of the time, take it. Before we look at this great trade that was made, I want to look at the people involved here. We'll start with the man with leprosy. I call him a weary man. He's the weary man in the text. I say he's weary because there was no more fear disease in this day and age than leprosy. Leprosy was much more common then than it is today for many reasons, partly because of the unsanitary conditions that people lived in. Partly due to the unsanitary conditions in the um, geographical area and the climate that they experienced in this part of the world, led to a lot of hygiene issues, which also led to a lot of skin problems. But one of the reasons why leprosy was so common back then is because many times leprosy would be misdiagnosed. Many issues were diagnosed as leprosy. Many common skin problems would be diagnosed as leprosy. People would develop rashes or even heavy dandruff or what we would know of and call today eczema and many other types of skin issues like that and mistakenly be classified as lepers during these days. If someone was suspected as having leprosy, they had to, in their shame and humiliation, drag their bones and their dreaded condition over to the priest who would examine them. And he would look at them and he would, he would tell them whether they had leprosy or not, if he could tell. But many times he couldn't tell, and so he would say, you have to be quarantined for seven days, and then I will re-examine you in a week. They would come back, and if the condition had gotten worse, they would many times, most of the time, be diagnosed with leprosy. If the condition hadn't gotten worse or was only marginally worse, the priest did have had his disposal another seven-day quarantine for a total of two weeks where he could quarantine the person for another week and then come back and check them again. But at the end of two weeks, a decision had to be made and something had to be decided. A diagnosis had to be provided. And if you were diagnosed with leprosy as this man was, at that point, you were banished from everything in society because leprosy is contagious. And in Jesus' day, it was much less understood than it is today. People in Jesus' day thought that leprosy spread not only by touching it or touching you, but they thought it spread through the air and it it can through water droplets in your mouth or your coughing or your sneezing and things of that nature. It, it can be transferred that way. 
But they thought if you were just in the general proximity of somebody who had it, there was a good chance you would pick it up as well. It's why if you were diagnosed with leprosy, you had to stay a minimum of six feet away from everybody else. And if it was windy, you had to stay 150 feet away from everybody else. The Old Testament law that governed leprosy can be seen in places like Leviticus 13.45. This isn't the only place, but it's the only one I'll share. It says the person who has a case of serious skin disease is to have his clothes torn, his hair hanging loose, and he must cover his mouth and cry out, unclean, unclean. He will remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He must live alone in a place outside the camp. So if you were diagnosed with leprosy, it destroyed your life. You had to be physically identifiable with your clothing and your hair and things of that nature. You had to be verbally identifiable. If other people approached you or came close to you, you had to cover your mouth and scream, unclean, unclean, so everyone would know. You had to be socially identifiable, staying outside the camp, living only with other lepers. It's impossible for us to understand how devastating this would have been to anyone who contracted leprosy or anything that resembled leprosy. Masterman said this, he said, no other disease reduces a human being for so many years to so hideous a wreck. It's a good way to describe it. Another commentator wrote, lepers were people who were already dead, though still alive. Another good description of your life as a leper. The physical toll of leprosy was excruciating on your body and your bones. The mental and emotional toll would have been extremely agonizing, being banished and separated from everybody and everything. The social toll of leprosy would have been nothing short of terrible. Imagine being totally isolated from everybody else. And I know some of you are going, that sounds pretty good, really. I don't know what's the problem. But we're not talking about for a long weekend. We're not talking about for a week's vacation. We're talking about for the rest of your life. Imagine being absolutely forbidden from going anywhere other people were. Imagine having to cry out everywhere you went, unclean, unclean. Imagine suffering in seclusion and silence without any hope of a cure because there was no cure for leprosy. In recent years, modern medicine and technology has developed a cure, a series of antibiotics, combination, cocktail of them, which can actually cure leprosy, but nothing like that existed in this day and this time. This man was weary from his trials. He was weary from his sickness. He was weary from his burden. He was a weary man. He went into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. And then a man with leprosy came to him on his knees and begged him, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Do you see why he would have been weary? Worn out, worried. Do you see why this man would have been desperate and disturbed and discouraged and distressed? Can you see how this man would have been totally demoralized and distraught and absolutely devastated by his condition, his prognosis, and his situation? That's why this man with leprosy came and got down on his knees and begged him. Because he was weary. In Luke's account, it says in Luke 5.12, that he fell face down. This man has his face in the dirt, begging Jesus to make a trade. He was willing to trade anything if Jesus would just take this away from him. He wanted to trade this awful, nasty death sentence of a disease for anything 
He could. If Jesus offers you a trade, take it. Next, we see what I call the willing Messiah. It's Jesus. This weary man knows that his only hope is a willing God, a willing Messiah. He knows that his condition can't be cured. He knows there's no money, no amount of money that's going to fix it. He knows there's no medicine that's going to fix it. He knows time isn't going to fix it. He knows only God can fix it. And so here he is at the feet of Jesus saying, would you fix it? And Jesus is going to meet this man one-on-one right there where he is, right there in the dirt. Look at it in verse 41. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and he touched him. Period. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. There are two important things I want to make you aware of here in this text. Two important things I want you to see. The first revolves around what Jesus did. And what we should do when we're trying to be like Jesus and deal with people one at a time and love them one at a time and minister to them one at a time just like this. Notice that it says Jesus was moved with compassion. I bet you can relate to that, can't you? You've been moved to compassion At some point in your life, we've all been moved with compassion at some time or another. Think about it for a moment. What is it that that moves your heart? What is it that breaks your heart? What are the things that you've seen and heard or heard about that stir and swell your soul with compassion and great concern. Now let me ask you this, what have you done about it? What have you done about those things? Have you done anything at all? Because look at what happens. Jesus, he reached out his hand and he touched him. Period. Here's what I want you to notice about this. Jesus touched him before he healed him. He reached out and touched him before he healed him. This man hasn't been touched in a long time, y'all. This man has been isolated and secluded. He's been cast out of society. Nobody has touched him in a long, long while. And here he is on his knees with his face in the dirt, begging Jesus to make a trade. And then he feels somebody, Jesus, reach out and touch him. I have a feeling it sent a shiver up his spine. It probably scared him. Has anybody ever reached out and touched you when you weren't expecting it? He kind of jumped. Imagine how it would have felt to this man who hasn't felt a touch in a long time, who's not expecting a touch. What a foreign feeling, what a forgotten feeling this touch must have been when he felt it upon him. And even if it didn't scare the man, it certainly scared everybody who was watching Jesus because the one thing you never did with a leper was touch him. Not unless you wanted to get it. The accounts in Matthew and Luke both reported exactly this way as well. They both say that Jesus reached out and touched him before he healed him. Reaching out his hand, Matthew 8, 3, Jesus touched him, saying, I'm willing, be made clean. He touched him, then healed him. Luke chapter 5, verse 13, reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him, saying, I am willing, be made clean. He reached out and touched him before he healed him. Now, Jesus didn't have to touch him to heal him. Jesus didn't have to touch him to have compassion on him. Jesus did not have to touch him to change his life. But Jesus made the choice to reach out and touch him anyway. 
The point is this, it's great to have compassion. It's great to care. It, it, it's great when your heart is moved, church. But it's even better when you're willing to do something about it. It's even better when you're willing to reach out and touch them. It's even better when your compassion and your care and your heart manifest its way in some form or fashion so somebody can experience it. And listen, I'm not saying you need to go around touching everybody. That's going to get you in trouble. Okay? But it can be as simple as a smile. It can be as simple as just a word of encouragement. It can be as simple as writing a card or making a phone call or sending a text. It, it might just be helping a neighbor in some practical way, meet a need you know needs to be met. The point is, don't miss an opportunity to allow your compassion to reach out and also touch someone. And here's the second thing that jumped out at me, and this one's big, and this is practical, and I think this is going to hit many of us. This weary, weak, worn-out man had... No doubt that Jesus had the power to heal him. The question he had in his heart and in his mind as he approached Jesus was not, do you have the power to do it? The question was not, can you do it? He knew Jesus had the power to do it. We don't know how he knew Jesus had the power to do it. We don't know if this man had heard about Jesus from other people we don't know if this man had seen Jesus do some miraculous things to others as he stood off in a distance and thought, man, if that guy can help him or her, maybe he can help me. Whatever it was, it's clear though in the text, the man has no doubt Jesus has the power to heal him. He has no doubt that Jesus can do it. It's why this man didn't say, if you can. Instead, he said these words, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He knew he could do it. His question was, are you willing to do it? Not, are you able to do it? I bring this up because I think for most of us, catch this, I think for most of us, it's much easier for us to believe in God's power than it is for us to believe in God's mercy. Certainly the case for this man. He had full confidence in the power of God where his confidence was lacking was in the mercy and the grace of God. And I know some of us, perhaps many of us, right now are in a place where we know God can do it. We're just wondering if God will do it. Many of us right now are in a place where we know God has the power to do it. We just wonder if he will do it. The question isn't, is he able in our hearts? We believe in his power. What we don't believe is in his mercy. We know he has the power. We just wonder if he will. See, I want to encourage you not just to trust the power of God, but to trust the love and the mercy and the grace of God too. And I want to tell you once again, if Jesus offers you a trade, take it. The third person we see in the text is the same as the first. That weary man is healed and he becomes something different. He becomes what I'll call the wayward missionary. The wayward missionary. He's the exact same person as the weary man, except he's been healed. <laughs> The weary man is healed and then he turns into a disobedient missionary. I say wayward because that's what he does. I mean, the very first thing he does, his first thing he does after Jesus changes his life is he disobeys Jesus. Now, don't you be laughing. A bunch of y'all do the same thing. <laughs> he, he accepts the trade. He takes his great healing he gets his great gift of mercy, and immediately, the first thing he does is disobey Jesus. And the request that Jesus put before him wasn't that hard. 
But it was very important. Look, look at the request in verse 43. Then he sternly warned him. How many of y'all, by amen, have ever sternly warned your children? Oh, yeah. How many of y'all were ever sternly warned by your mama and daddy? See, here's the deal. A stern warning is clear, is it not? A stern warning usually includes some form of repetition. A stern warning is a simple thing for everybody to understand. A stern warning outlines not vague, but very detailed, defined, clear guardrails that everybody's aware of, right? Jesus sternly warned this man. And sent him away at once. And what was this stern warning? Well, he said, See that you say nothing to anyone. Keep your mouth shut. But go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet, he went out and began to proclaim it widely. And to spread the news. See, Jesus wanted this cleansing to be a testimony to the hard-hearted religious leaders of the day. He wanted him to show up to the priest, probably the priest who had diagnosed him, and say, look, I'm all better. That man named Jesus did this. He wanted him to go through the process for a reason He he wanted him to keep his mouth shut for a reason. He wanted him to go to the priest for a reason. He wanted him to go through the process for a reason. He wanted him to be declared clean by the priest for a reason. He wanted him to do all of that for many reasons. Part of it was so he could be restored to society legally, fully returned to society Part of it was he wanted these hard-hearted religious leaders to see an overwhelming testimony they would not be able to deny of God's power. And, And there's probably other parts to this as well. He just says, hey, keep your mouth shut. Go to the priest. Let him do what he's got to do. Let him declare you clean. And that's going to be a testimony to them. But no, this loud mouth knucklehead decided he's just going to do it his own way. And he goes out and immediately disobeys Jesus. He went out, and instead of keeping his mouth shut, he proclaimed it widely and spread the news. Now, please hear me. When I call him a loudmouth knucklehead, I'm saying that sarcastically. Because I will be the first to proclaim that like this man, I too have disobeyed on more than one occasion Jesus. I've opened my mouth when it should have been shut, and I've shut my mouth when it should have been open, and I've gone where I shouldn't have gone, and I've not gone where I should have gone. I'm not condemning this man. I'm not judging this man. I'm not saying I'm better than this man because I know that I'm not. I know that just like this man, had I been him, I would have struggled and most likely failed to be obedient to this simple request to keep my mouth shut. I I don't know that I could have. I I get his excitement. I get his enthusiasm. I'm sure his intentions were pure. I'm sure he thought he was doing the right thing by telling everybody about what Jesus had done. But church, can I tell you, we will never know the full scope of this man's disobedience because all sin carries with it consequences. And this instance is no different. There are consequences we can see and consequences we can't see. Look again with me at verse 45. I want you to see the result of all of this. It's right there for us in Scripture, and here's the trade. Yet he went out and began to proclaim it widely and to spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he was out in deserted places, and they came to him from everywhere. It's right there that the trade I spoke of at the beginning happened. You see, Jesus didn't just trade this man's sickness for a healing. He didn't just trade his leprosy for pure, beautiful, restored skin. 
Jesus, in a very real way, according to all of the writers who recount this, traded places with the man. This weary man who becomes a wayward missionary, Jesus trades places with him. At the beginning of this event, the man with leprosy was on the outside. Now Jesus is. At the beginning, the man with leprosy is the one who couldn't enter a town openly. Now Jesus can't. At the beginning, it was the man with leprosy who had been banished and pushed out to deserted places. And now it's Jesus who's there. I know for a group of professional experienced traders like yourselves, I'm Certain that was fairly easy to see and you spotted it, but it's an important, important point. You know, the Jewish historian Josephus said that there were approximately 240 towns in the region of Galilee. And we know from Scripture that it was Jesus' intention to go to every single one of those towns and preach the good news to all of them, to tell all of them about the kingdom of heaven. In fact, if you back up to verse 38, right before our story today begins, Jesus said this in Mark 1, 38, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I've come. He says, I came to preach to all these villages. And we know that Jesus was not able to go to all of these places. We know he didn't make it to all 240 villages. And the turning point for that happened right here in our text because this man opened his mouth. I get it. The man was excited. I get it. I'm sure he thought his intentions were pure and he was doing the right thing. I know he couldn't keep his mouth shut. But I think the lesson from that is pretty simple as well. And it's one we all need to learn. And that is this. God's plan is always the right plan. And God's way is always the right way. And we should always do our best to be obedient to whatever it is God's plan is, not our own. And the truth still remains, if Jesus offers you a trade, take it. Again, to a group of professional, lifelong, experienced traders like yourselves, I'm sure you can see that this man made a heck of a trade. If Jesus offers you a trade, take it. Some of you might even be thinking, man, I wish I could make a trade like that. I wish I could make a great trade like that man did. Well, I have some good news to you. Jesus is still trading. He's still willing to trade with you. And he's still offering great trades today. That's why I've been telling you, if he offers you a trade, take it. You know, Jesus will trade your sorrow for joy. He'll, he'll trade still today, this very day. He'll trade your shame and guilt for freedom. You, you can bring your fear and your anxiety to Jesus and he'll trade it for peace that surpasses all understanding. You can come to Jesus in the middle of your loneliest and darkest season in life and he'll trade it immediately for love. You can bring your broken life, no matter how shatter, shattered it is, and bring all of your brokenness down here to the altar this very hour and you can trade it for holiness. You can trade your hurt for healing. You can trade your sin for salvation. If Jesus offers you a trade, my advice is take it. And it's crazy to me how many people keep passing up these great trades. Especially the cross. You know, that's what the cross was. It was a trade. God traded his son for your salvation. The sinless lamb of God died on your cross for you. Just like he traded places with this man, that's what the cross was for you. He traded places. He died on your cross so you could be made pure, so you could live in 
heaven so you could conquer death. What a great trade, for you at least. That God would give his one and only son so you could live. That God would be willing to trade places with you and take your punishment for you. He said, I'll take your sin and I'll trade it for salvation. And all you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Jesus is offering you a trade. My advice is, take it. Let's pray. If you are here today or can hear my voice and have never called on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I have good news. He died for you. He loves you and He's willing to make a trade with you today. If you will believe and confess. We're not going to ask you to come to the altar, though it's open. If you want to come down here and trade something with Jesus when the music begins to play, feel free. But you can do business with God right now, right there where you're at. Give Him your sin and He will trade it for salvation. If that's you, just say this. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would save me from the inside out. I ask by faith that you would make me new. That you would make me whole. That you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me. And give me the great gift of eternal life. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness. For your love and for your mercy. And I thank you for being willing to make a trade with me today. Lord, as we prepare to close, we just... Lord, I just want to say thank you. Lord, I'm thankful that you continue to trade with us, though you always get the short end of the deal. I'm thankful that despite our unfaithfulness and our disobedience... You continue to allow us to come to the altar and make a trade. Lord, you never take more than you give. You never require more than you offer. You've never once, as far as I can see, in all of Scripture, all the testimony of my life, put me in a situation where I came out on the short end of it. And Lord, we just don't deserve that kind of grace and mercy, but what a testimony to your goodness and faithfulness it is. So thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray for those who can hear my voice who need to trade something today. I pray they would do it. I pray they would take the trade. And then help us to be obedient and do whatever it is you've called us to do. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we ask and we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.